In a conference that has made only two college football playoff appearances, it can be difficult to find coaches that separate themselves from one another. Yet there is one coach that separates himself from all the other Pac-12 coaches. Find out who that is and why right here on the Gridiron Expert. And the one head coach that stands out among the rest, the best head coach in the Pac-12 is, no surprise, Chris Peterson at Washington. Peterson is 139-33 and 33 in his career. And of course, we all know, put himself on the map with uh, the job that he did at Boise State, doing phenomenal things there, getting them to multiple BCS bowl games, including a huge win uh, over Oklahoma in the Fiesta Bowl. That was the game that really put the Broncos on the map. But he's done phenomenal things at Washington, too. He's 47-21 and 21 during his time with the Huskies, has gotten them two Pac-12 titles in the past three years, and has also led them to three straight New Year's Six Bowl games, one of those being in the college football playoff, a Fiesta Bowl appearance, and then a Rose Bowl appearance. Now, unfortunately for Peterson, all of those three games have been losses, but nonetheless, uh, Washington fans couldn't ask for anything better for putting them back on the map and doing extremely well in the Pac-12. So it's no surprise and really without a doubt to have Chris Peterson up here as our best head coach in our Pac-12 head coaching rankings. Coming in right behind him, though, is David Shaw at Stanford. And another phenomenal job that he has done here. David Shaw, a coach that I think uh, doesn't really get a lot of credit nationally. He's usually uh, considered one of the better head coaches in the Pac-12, much like we have here. But not a lot of people talk about him on the national stage. But he is 82-26 and 26 in eight years with the Cardinal. Has won at least eight games in every year as head coach there. And has won three Pac-12 titles with Stanford. So one thing you have to say about David Shaw is how consistent he has been with Stanford. Now there have been years that they have had high expectations and maybe they didn't meet those expectations. There have been years that they have been in contention for a college football playoff appearance, but maybe they slipped up too early in the season or maybe they slipped up a little too late in the season and it prevented them from getting in there. But nonetheless, David Shaw has done a phenomenal job, especially taking over after Jim Harbaugh left for the NFL. And now he's back, of course, in the college ranks at Michigan, but doing a phenomenal job stepping in there, coming up on nearly a decade with Stanford. And he has once again kept them not only relevant in the Pac-12, but also relevant on the national stage year in and year out. Coming in at number three, we have Mike Leach. Now, some people may say that Leach is way too high on this list, and I'm here to change your mind. He's 133-83 and 83 overall, which is not a great record in the grand scheme of things. It's a winning record, well above 500. But we got to keep in mind, when we're doing these rankings, we're not solely basing it on what happened last year. We're not solely basing it on what happened two years ago. It's what happened last year. It's their track record as a coach over the course of their entire career. And it's also, uh, you know, what's the upward trend of their program at this time? Are things looking up for them? Are things looking down for them? And things are certainly looking up for Washington State in Pullman. We all know the great job that Leach did at Texas Tech and implementing the air raid offense and doing pretty, pretty good things there. I mean, he really put Texas Tech on the map, had them very, very high in the rankings. At Washington State, he is 49 and 40. And he really, the reason he gets so much credit here, and the reason he's so high up on this list is because he revived a struggling Washington State program. In 2015, he led Washington State to their best record since 2003. And in 2013, he got them to their first bowl game since 2003. Last year, he had Washington State in contention for not only a Pac-12 title, but also slightly the college football playoff until they lost in the Apple Cup to Chris Peterson in Washington. But nonetheless, he has put Washington State back on the map, uh, obviously with a huge influx of offensive production, what he is known for. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. He's doing a phenomenal job recruiting, landing some big time transfers, did another uh, great quarterback transfer this year. Things are looking up in Pullman for Mike Leach, and he certainly deserves to be in the top three of Pac-12 coaches. Number four, one of the longest tenured head coaches in the Pac-12 right now is Kyle Whittingham, who has been with the Utes since 2004. Now, one of the biggest uh, kind of concerns for Utes fans is that Kyle Whittingham has not been able to bring a Pac-12 title to Utah. He has yet to win that. But he has won nine or more games eight times in his career. He is 120 and 61 over the course of his entire career with the Utes, and he is 11 and 2 in bowl games. So, like we mentioned with David Shaw, Kyle Whittingham, one of the more consistent head coaches in the Pac-12. We have a lot of those coaches on this list that you can consider uh, being very consistent. But if you went back and you looked at our postseason uh, records, our top 30 postseason teams, you saw where Utah was 17-5 and five over the course of their entire program history as one of the best. And we have that here with 11 bowl wins under Kyle Whittingham. So he's doing a phenomenal job with the Utes. And he's leading a team this year that some consider to be a dark horse playoff contender uh, and some certainly believing to be a major contender in the Pac-12. So we'll have to wait and find out, but I wouldn't expect anything less out of a Whittingham-led team. 
Coming in at number five is Chip Kelly. Now, another, another thing, some people might believe that Chip Kelly shouldn't be this high, especially with the job that he did at UCLA last year, going just three and nine, and what was a very, very disappointing year for the Bruins. But keep in mind the job that he did at Oregon, 46 and seven with the Ducks in just a couple years there. Now, he did win two BCS Copper Bowl games, a Rose Bowl and a Fiesta Bowl, got to a national championship, of course, they did lose to Cam Newton and the Auburn Tigers. But he hasn't been, he's only been in the uh, college ranks for five years, four years with Oregon, one year with UCLA, bolted for the NFL, where he did not have very good success with the Eagles and the 49ers. But Chip Kelly is still one of the most elite head coaches in the Pac-12 and was slowly building up this UCLA program that I think can eventually get to the dominance that Oregon had, that he had during his time at Oregon. It might not happen this year, might not happen next year, but I think if the UCLA gives him time, he will be able to get him there. And we did start to see a little bit of improvement from UCLA towards the end of last season. So that's why he comes in at number five. And I think that's where you have a cutoff here. I think this is where you really cut it off as the kind of elite coaches in the Pac-12. Everybody below Chip Kelly, six to 12, is really kind of, I mean, they're average. They're not bad. We, we can get to some bad ones here in a second. But they're nothing compared to Chip Kelly, Whittingham, Leach, Shaw, or Peterson. Those are your elite coaches in the Pac-12. Everybody else is kind of middle of the pack. And we'll start here with Justin Wilcox, who did a phenomenal job last year at California. You know, I'll say two years ago, I did not have very high expectations for Wilcox and the Golden Bears of California. They, uh, he came in with a very young team, a fresh new head coach, a young head coach. I think I had them going 1-11. He got them to 5-7. and seven. He's just 12-13 and 13 overall during his time at California. But last year, after a very surprising year one, got them to a bowl game, 7-6 and six overall. Of course, losing the Cheez-It Bowl to Gary Patterson and... Uh, TCU in what was one of the most ugliest bowl games I've ever watched, but nonetheless got them back to the postseason. Things are certainly trending up for Wilcox, who was bringing in uh, a somewhat veteran team at California this year, at least a little bit more experienced, finally implementing his style of play. And things are certainly looking up for him, and that's why we have him at six, above the likes of maybe Mario Cristobal or an experienced coach in Kevin Sumlin. And right behind Wilcox, we do have Cristobal, who in just year one with Oregon went nine and four and is now has a team that is kind of sky-high expectations in 2019. People are talking about them being, not only winning the Pac-12, uh, but also being a college football playoff contender. And he certainly has the team to do it. He has done a phenomenal job recruiting in just a year. He has one of the best quarterbacks in the entire nation, and Justin Herbert, a surefire first-round NFL draft pick, assuming he can stay healthy. This is kind of a make-or-break year for Oregon if they want to get back on that national stage and compete for a college football playoff spot. This is the year they have to do it, and it all relies uh, in the hands of Mario Cristobal. Now, a lot of people kind of give him a lot of hate because he didn't do that great at Florida International, but he also got them the back-to-back bowl games at Florida International, and that's a very, very difficult thing to do. So he's number seven right now because he hasn't been in the Pac-12 for that long in terms of being a head coach, but he's also number seven above the likes of everybody else here because of the upward trend that he has going on at Oregon, and I truly am a believer of Mario Cristobal, and I think he has a lot of big things in store for the Ducks this season. Coming in at number eight, we have Kevin Sumlin. And, you know, some people might think he needs to be a little bit higher. You know, and once again, leave your rankings in the comments below. We want to hear from you guys. Do you agree with these rankings? And if you don't, leave your comments below. List your rankings 1 through 12 of the Pac-12 because this is what really starts some conversations. And we love to hear other people's opinions. So we have Kevin Sumlin here who is 56 and 33 during his combined time at Texas A&M and Arizona. Of course, last year being his first year with the Wildcats. Problem with what he did at Texas A&M was he had some very fast starts with the Aggies, getting them to 5-0, maybe 6-0. But then he ended up finishing 8-5 three straight years in a row. There were multiple instances where Texas A&M was ranked in the top 10, maybe top 8 of the rankings, and then ended up slipping towards down the stretch and resulted in a mediocre bowl game uh, that you know really didn't mean much, especially when they had their sights set on such uh, high expectations. Now, to Kevin Sumlin does know how to utilize his talent. I expected more out of him last year with the likes of Khalil Tate and a better offense uh, at Arizona. But we've seen what he's done at Houston with Case Keenum. We saw what he did at Texas A&M with Johnny Manziel and briefly with Kenny Hill. Kevin Sumlin knows how to coach in the SEC. SEC is the best conference in college football, in my opinion. He comes over to the Pac-12, and although he didn't have very good success in year one, I expect by year two, maybe even year three, that Arizona will be uh, really rising high and doing extremely well in the conference. So he's number eight right now, above the likes of Clay Helton, who's in a much better position in terms of recruiting talent and getting big-time talent, but yet cannot utilize it. They call him Hot Seat Helton for a reason, because he is certainly on the hot seat going into 2019. 
He's only been with USC for three full years and he's 26 and 13 during that time. And a lot of people will think that he needs to be higher and maybe he's not even on the hot seat at all because he did win a Rose Bowl with USC. He did get to another New Year's Six Bowl game the year after losing the Cotton Bowl to Ohio State. But last year he goes five and seven minutes out in a bowl game. And that's just not acceptable by USC standards. It's not acceptable to not win the big games and not even make the postseason with the amount of talent that USC brings in. Now, I know last year was the first year that they went without their star quarterback and Sam Darnold and some other big-time offensive playmakers. But nonetheless, when you are at the University of Southern California, you have to be able to utilize that talent. Clay Helton has not been able to do that. And there were multiple instances where people thought USC was going to be more of a playoff contender and not just missing out and going to New Year's Six Bowl games. USC wants to be that playoff contender, wants to be relevant on the national stage. If Helton does not win, I'm going to say at least eight games this season, he might be out of a job. And many people think that Urban Meyer might come out of retirement to take the job. We'll have to wait and find out about that. But he's hot seat Helton for a reason. That's why he's number nine, because even though he did well in his first two years, that was with a bunch of talent that really wasn't his own doing. Now we really get to see the first instance of Clay Helton's doing last year. Let's see how he can improve on it in 2019. Number 10, Herm Edwards, a guy that I loved down at Arizona State. One of the best tires I thought of last offseason. I think he exceeded a lot of expectations last year getting the Sun Devils to a bowl game in a 7-6 and six record. They lost to Fresno State in their bowl game, one of the better group of five schools last season. Keep in mind, before last year, Herm Edwards hadn't coached a college or coached a college football game back since, like I think, the 80s or 90s, hadn't coached a football game since 2008 during his time in the NFL. One other thing to mention is that all five of Arizona State's regular season losses were by just one possession. So they could have been a very different season for Herm Edwards and the Sun Devils had they been able to close out those close games. Regardless, Arizona State does lose a lot of talent this year, including Nikhil Harriet, wide receiver, and their star quarterback, and Manny Wilkins. That is why Herm Edwards is down here at number 10. He's not last because he did a pretty decent job last year, but he loses a lot of talent. To me, that's a bit of a downward slide. Let's see how he can react to that and improve the Sun Devils team and see if they can get it back to the postseason in 2019. But regardless, I still think it was one of the best hires of last year. I'm a huge fan of him down at Arizona State, and I can't wait to see what he has in store for 2019. Then our last two here, we have Mel Tucker and Jonathan Smith. Mel Tucker, even though he has yet to coach uh, a game at Colorado, gets the edge above Jonathan Smith because of the job that Mel Tucker did at Georgia, being a phenomenal defensive coordinator, and also the fact that Mel Tucker does have NFL coaching experience. He was briefly an interim head coach for the Jacksonville Jaguars, as well as being defensive coordinators for the Browns and the Bears. Now, he did not do very well with Chicago, Part of the reason he fell back down to the college ranks. Despite that, he did get to coach in the NFL a little bit. Did phenomenal things at Georgia. Jonathan Smith, a guy that went 2-10 in year one, was kind of the Oregon State's wonder boy. You know, he did phenomenal things with them back during his playing days. I think it's great they brought him back. A guy that understands their program and trying to bring them back to just relevancy in the Pac-12. But it was not a solid year one. And I really think their future is very cloudy and under the Jonathan Smith era. We're going to have to wait and see kind of how he does in 2019-2020. Beaver fans have to be patient with him, but Mel Tucker at Colorado gets the slight edge over him because of his prior experience, because of what he did at such a uh, difficult school in Georgia, such a difficult conference, getting them to a national championship, multiple or at least a college football playoff appearance, what he did there. Jonathan Smith falls at 12 and last in our Pac-12 head coaching rankings. So there you have it, 1 through 12. Our best head coach, Chris Peterson, followed by Jonathan Smith at last. And we once again mentioned that we think it is a kind of a tier thing starting ending at Chip Kelly. That is your elite Pac-12 coaches. Everybody below is kind of mediocre or in the lower tier, but these are your five elite coaches in the Pac-12. Let's see if these mediocre coaches can kind of knock some of these guys off their pedestal in what should be a very fun year in the Pac-12. So as always, thank you for watching. Please continue to like, comment, subscribe, and we will see you next time here on the Gridiron Expert.